Okay, but again, they miss the point. Okay, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Inseparable but distinct in three people. Uh, three persons. And uh, the Son taking on human flesh, never separated, but still, He's going to have communication with the Father. Okay. Uh, he was tempted. And uh, it's not a sin to be tempted. Okay. It's a sin when we fall to temptation. Okay. And uh, when we think about Jesus, why in the world was he put in a place to be tempted? Because he couldn't sin. And uh, that's one of the questions. Could Jesus sin? No, he could never sin. Why? Because he was God. He was 100% God. Now, he's also 100% man. He took on human flesh. But God can never sin. We can never have to worry about God turning bad, God uh, not doing what's right, or anything right like that. Jesus being the same uh, could never do that. And all it does is the temptation reveals, the temptation reveals who we really are. See, what we really are about. So in the temptation of Jesus, it, it just simply reveals to us that he's sinless and that he can't sin. He's incapable of sin. He learned obedience. That's a powerful statement found in Hebrews 5 and verse 8. Though he were, were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Uh, it's one thing of just like God saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to I'm going to provide a way. I'm going to provide a lamb that taketh away the sin, and sin of the world. But then, it's another thing to do it. So he did it. So here you have Jesus, okay? Jesus who's fully obedient in all things, okay? But how did he learn obedience? Well, it's a thing of actually doing it, isn't it? It's one thing for me to say, uh, Say, uh, I love the Lord, and if this temptation came in my way, I can guarantee you I'm going to be obedient. But then if the temptation came my way, and if I wasn't obedient, so you had to, I have to learn the obedience. I have to actually do obedience in that way. See. Uh, the Bible says that he, just like every human, we, he hungered. He got hungry. He got thirsty. <clears throat> okay. Uh, he got tired. He was weary. The Bible says he slept. I think he slept a whole lot more peacefully than probably we do. He loved. He had compassion. He was angered and grieved. It's a righteous anger. Jesus exercised a righteous anger. It's okay to be angry at sin. Okay, it's a righteous anger. Uh, he grieved. He wept. He experienced joy. He was troubled. He sweat drops as of blood. He suffered. He bled. He died. He was buried. Okay, so uh, 100. He took on flesh and became 100% man. He understands you. He experienced things that you experience. Yeah, without sin. He fully understands what you're going through. He's a great high priest. You can go to him and you can run to him. He knows. He's compassionate. He has empathy for what you're going through, okay? And then uh, when we think about Jesus, we talk about the deity of Jesus Christ. We've talked about that often. Uh, uh, he, he's declared to be God. He's equal uh, in identity with God. He's equal, has equality with God himself. Uh, as well. Uh, the Bible is all through reveals this in Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, he shares glory with God. The Bible says, speaks of uh, sharing the glory of God. God will share His glory with no one, but, uh, and, but Jesus shares glory. Uh, he is also all-powerful. Jesus exercised at times uh, at times he learned himself, uh, but at times he, he showed. If you would just look at the works of Jesus, he did the works that only God can do. And uh, he was omnipotent, all-powerful. He was omniscient. Uh, the testimony was given of Jesus in John, 6, uh, John 16, verse 30. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. 
By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Notice it. Notice it. He can read people's heart. He knows our heart. He knows, he knows uh, the motives of people. He revealed the motives of the disciples. He knew what they were up to. It shocked them sometimes. Okay? Uh, he knew when the disciples were struggling, what problems they had. Uh, one of the great testimonies is found in John 1, verse 48. Nathaniel said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Here was the guy, man, that's all it took for him. And he said, Wow, this is the Messiah. So he knows. He knows our heart. But he also receives worship. Now, Jesus himself said, uh, said that only God is to be worshipped. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve and worship. But yeah, when people worship Him, He received it. Why? Because He was God. The greatest example of that was, all through His ministry, but the greatest example of that, of course, was Thomas. We looked at Thomas early on. Thomas answered and said unto Him, My Lord and my God, my Jehovah and my Elohim. But he also forgives sins. Now it's said that only God can forgive sins. If only God can forgive sins, then why in the world would Jesus say, Your sin, thy sins are forgiven thee? Now that got the Pharisees really upset. Because they knew only God could forgive sins. But here was God in the flesh forgiving sins. His authority is the same as God. He's the source of life itself. Described as the source of life, the creator of all things, preserver of all things, alone can meet our needs. He's the one we need to run to. He's the answer. He receives our prayers. And he's the final judge. The Bible describes him as both Lord and King. Okay? Now, he's deity or he's God. We, we've looked at that pretty much deep in uh, studying the Trinity. And then there's the impeccability of Jesus. simply means this, Jesus cannot sin. Sort of cover that. Jesus cannot sin. And uh, it just can't happen. Now through Jesus and His work and all that uh, and through His life uh, we have the revealing of the character of Jesus Christ. And uh, what kind of person was our Lord? What were some of His characteristics? That's important to know because we want to model and live our life and mold our life just like the character of Jesus. The Bible talks about Him having zeal and things like zeal and compassion, meekness and gentleness. That He was courageous. Think about the things that he went through and that he stood for. He talks about his obedience, his love. He was a man of great character. In fact, Jesus was a man of the finest of character. Jesus was a man of the perfect character. And everything he did, he, he exercised the right character. And then the Bible talks about the kenosis of Jesus Christ. The kenosis of Jesus Christ. Probably point nine on your thing. What in the world does kenosis mean? It's K-E-N-O-S-I-S. -S. It talks about a divine emptying. So you have God, God of all eternity, God of all glory, coming, taking on human flesh. The Bible talks about uh, uh, emptying. And uh, it's a great doctrinal truth. In essence, summarizes both what the Savior gave up and what He gained as a result of His earthly ministry. So the Savior, in j just in taking on human flesh and coming into, into uh, this earth and into humanity, He gave up certain things for a time, didn't He? I mean, that, that's, we understand that. He left the glories of heaven. Okay, but he also gained something. And that was something a little different. Okay. 
Now think about it. He left heaven's glory. Okay? He left heaven's glory. He, in, in essence, he became a missionary. A foreign missionary. He left the glory of heaven, the king of kings, the throne of thrones, and came and took on in the most humblest of way. That's another part of his great character is his humility. And he took on a baby. Now, let's say you created all things, you controlled all things. You you probably come an all powerful man. I mean you come in power and you put you'd set things things straight right off the bat. I think I probably would. Jesus takes on in the most humblest way a baby. He has to be fed. He has to be taken care of. Wow. I mean that that's just awesome. The Bible says that he made him of himself of no reputation. Uh, now, all the glory of God, he's God. He takes all the glory of God, is hid for a time, is hid in a way, though in the inner self he's, he's still God, but he still has the human shell. So he's hiding somewhat the glory, isn't he? So he's given that up. He's hiding it for a time. Okay? And he would abstain from certain God things for, for a time, the Bible says. He was made in the likeness of men. He humbled himself. Uh, but then the Bible says uh, there's something there between the, the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that is very special during this time of, of Him uh, coming and dying for our, our, our sins. And the day will come that this Jesus, this Christ, will be acknowledged as Lord of Lords and King of Kings by every human being. Well, Jesus has certain offices it's the office of the prophet, the office of the priest, and the office of the king. Nobody, one person was to have those three offices. In the Old Testament, it talks about Melchizedek having uh, these special offices. In fact, God sometimes would uh, punish kings for trying to do things that the prophets would do, or the prophet. Uh, now the prophet, an it was an individual who represented God before man. So a prophet would take God's message, represent God before man. Should be maybe number ten on y'all's thing. And then the priest represented man before God. So a priest would go before God, uh, making sacrifices, representing uh, man before God. And then the king. Of course, ruled for God. Kings rule for God. They stand in God's place of rule and authority here. Now it's said of Jesus that He's the prophet, He's the priest, and that He's the king. Okay? So uh, all these offices was occupied by the Son of God. And uh, that, that's important to know. It's also important to think about the death of Christ. It's essential. It's essential to Christianity. Uh, were we to take away the cross of Christ, we would have no more salvation than any other religion. The death of Christ is a subject of supreme interest in heaven as well. Uh, and uh, Christ's death is extolled uh, above everything else. Uh, we should be filled with awe and wonder about Christ and His death. Uh, Christ, which uh, the Old Testament prophets of which salvation the prophets uh, wrote, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify 
when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. 1 Peter uh, 1, 10, 11 talks about that. So the prophets, look, now think about that for a moment. The prophets, he's saying there, uh, of which salvation the prophets have inquired. They looked into, they searched it out diligently. They thought about it, they pondered it. Uh, they prophesied, they preached about the grace that should come unto us. The grace that God was going to bring through Jesus' death, the fulfillment of His promise, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand. Get this, when it testified beforehand in the Old Testament the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And these all, the Bible says, having obtained a good report through faith, received uh, not the promise. Hebrews 11.39 They lived according to the promise, but the promise wasn't fulfilled in their day and time. It was fulfilled in Bethlehem. And then it was fulfilled in Jerusalem. It was fulfilled on Calvary. And it was fulfilled in the resurrection. See, they had the promise uh, before. So, uh, we think about Christ's death. Some people say, well, Judas was to blame, wasn't he? Some would say, uh, well, how about Annas and Ca Caiaphas? They plotted, had him killed. Pilate, he certainly said, uh, gave you the final orders. The Jewish leaders, they, they plotted. The Roman soldiers, they carried it out. You and I put him there, our sin. But the Father Himself was the primary source for Jesus' death. Is that shocking? The Bible says this, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, hath laid on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. It says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. It was the plan of God all along that there had to be uh, a payment for the sins of man. Had to be, uh, this thing had to be taken care of and uh, God was going to take care of it. Okay. Through Jesus. So, uh, and God prepared the people all the way. You had the uh, Passover lamb in the Old Testament. All picture of the coming Messiah. That there would be a Messiah who's going to die for sins and then glory would follow. Uh, the passage of the Red Sea. That's just, uh, you, you, you've heard of object lessons. Uh, Char Charlie here, I know, loves to bring kids forward and do uh, object lessons with them. Do, uh, where'd that come from? God did object lessons with the nation of Israel and people. Okay, the Red Sea was an object lesson of the ministry and the person and, and the death of Jesus. Uh, all through the Old Testament, the smitten rock, uh, the brazen serpent, uh, the Levit all the Levitical offerings, they were all pictures of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, His work. Uh, the ordinance of the red heifer found in Numbers uh, 19. The sacrifice of the Day of Atonement. Uh, all these things from over and over through as you, we read and study the Old Testament we're going to see Jesus that's why we're running through because Jesus is all through the Bible so every book we look at there's Jesus there's Jesus in the Bible okay as well but it all led to the culmination of Jesus' death burial and resurrection there was, that's the climax of all history a history past history future everything was looked forward to that time and everything that will ever happen from this time throughout all of eternity will look back to the time when the Lamb of God died for the sins of the world. Jesus shedding His precious blood. He 
shed his blood. The Bible says that he died. And as his body's laying in the tomb, the Bible says that he it was a descent into the heart of the earth. The Bible talks about this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, 1 Peter 3. 18 through 20, Ephesians 4, 9. Uh, between His death and His resurrection, our Lord descended into the lower parts of this earth to perform a twofold ministry, to depopulate the saved compartment of Hades. Remember in Luke 16, you had, you had uh, Hades. You had the saved and you had the lost in the saved compartments. You see that picture there uh, at, at, in Luke 16, verse 19 through 31. Well, God goes in, uh, the Lord Jesus goes in, uh, and He depopulates, He takes the saved out, and He brings them with, with Him just as He had promised. And He basically puts on that, that part of it vacant. <laughs> but He also, in that time, preached judgment unto the fallen angels. Preached judgment unto, hey, it's sealed. It's sealed. What you tried to stop couldn't be stopped. I've died for the sins of the world. And of course, the resurrection. And uh, some people have denied it uh, with different theories throughout history. But uh, we have a scriptural record, but we also have God's record of the resurrection. And everything is based on the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus just stayed in the grave, if Jesus never resurrected, then God never accepted His sacrifice for our sins. Jesus never resurrected. See, we don't have no more victory than any other religion. That's why people look, will try to attack the resurrection of Jesus. But the resurrection is undeniable. Jesus told us it was going to happen. The Bible says it was going to happen. God gave scriptural testimony. Uh, even some people doubted the resurrection after He resurrected, but Jesus proved them wrong and proved that He had resurrected. And then those same people that did not that didn't quite understand the resurrection or even doubted the resurrection, when they understood the resurrection, guess what? They were willing to die. Now you may be willing to die for something, but you're not going to be willing to die for something you don't believe in. Even a lost person will die. A lost person will give their life, but they'll, they'll give it for something they fully believe in. People gave their life to Jesus because they fully believe in the resurrection of Jesus because they said we've touched Him, we've handled Him. We know Him. We've seen Him. No matter what you say, we know Christ is alive. And He was resurrected. Been resurrected. Ascended. We have the empty tomb. We have the silence of His enemies. They had to try to make up a story. What are we going to do now? What are we going to tell now? Now we have no body. Uh, worship. If somebody says, uh, you know, uh, the day of worship in the beginning uh, is Saturday. What do they call that? Anybody know? What was the day day of worship in the, the Sabbath, remember? Somebody will say, you know, Sabbath is Saturday. Mm -hmm. Y'all know that? Mm -hmm. That's never been changed. Why we worship on Sunday then? Because God is doing a new thing. Jesus resurrected on Sunday. The church began to meet on Sundays, the day of His resurrection. So why, see, some people still want to hold to the law, hold to the Sabbath. Sabbath, well, Sabbath is Saturday, and that never changed there. But we worship on Sunday. God's doing a new thing. God's working through the church, see. God, God's own, uh, has a plan for the church. And the change from Saturday to Sunday is a, is a monumental thing. These people, these traditional Jewish people who always worshipped on Saturday, on the Sabbath day, all of a sudden begin to change and begin to come together. The Bible says they every day of the week. And we would do well in that. There was something special about Sunday. Say, it was all about the resurrection. The existence of the church. We're, there was no church. But the existence of the church all of a sudden comes in. Why? Because of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Jesus appears and has many 
uh, given testimony to to his appearances uh, as well. And uh, Jesus has given us many guarantees through his resurrection. And then Jesus ascended. And he serves today as what? Present day ministry of Christ is what? Our great high priest. Yeah. All right. And uh, just think about that functioning. We have a perfect high priest. A perfect high priest. Uh, he's coming. He's coming for his church. His church will be caught up in the air to meet him in the air. Mm -hmm. He's coming again for the millennial reign, millennial king. He's promised over and over again in Revelation. It says 1,000 years, 1,000 years. He's promised the nation Israel. He's coming. 